So I'm going to start with the motivation and an overview. Yeah. And so the idea is, you know, understanding vision, what is this approach, in particular, the modern day approach. Yeah. And so the idea is really uh, you know, start from the old days, uh, the, the signals coming from the camera, from the eyes, and then go to the primary visual cortex. You imagine that the CPU start going on. And of course, you know, you can just trace the hardware and people start tracing in the retina and realizing that the retina really is like a, you know, lots of dot detectors, where there's black dot, white dot, and the red dot, and they're spread all over the, uh, the, the field. And then you keep on going, tracing to the next stage, and people find these are the CNN like. Uh, edge detectors, you know, vertical, horizontal, tilted, and what kind. And you think you can just keep on tracing. Yeah, they they really only spend 10 years and tremendous amount of work. But however, the brain has, you know, the next stage, you can say this is a graphics car one and what's graph graphics car two and V2, V3, V4, et cetera. And uh, somehow after all these years, things are just not going well. Okay, so the idea is now that, 50 years later, you know, these people just did 10 years. So what happened? And this progress is not making and you still go to textbooks still stay in like 50 years before. And so sometimes people just say you asked the wrong question. Okay, so the new framework is let's say, can we go beyond this frontier? What is the new question? And you can say what is wrong with the traditional framework, for instance, people uh, spread vision into low level, mid level and high level. You know, this is really is kind of not falsifiable. What framework cannot be spread into these three, and therefore it's not enough to guide us. And of course, you can make yourself falsifiable by being more concrete, and then it's primal sketch to and half the model. Then you can say, well, he's right or he's wrong, right? And this is already 40 years ago. And if we had made some progress, then we would not be in this shape. Yeah. And so, therefore, what is the right question? And so, fundamentally, some new question, uh, you know, uh, need to. Uh, happen and what are these three stages in the new or well, not really these three it's also still three stages, the idea is there's a critical thing that. You, you start with lots of data coming in more or less about one megabytes per second, because we have 20 images per second each. Each is about one megabytes and you compress it in JPEG or MPEG or whatever kind of a compression you get about one megabytes and it's about whole 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 book. I can write a war and peace novel with it yeah and therefore you couldn't you couldn't really read it in one second and so therefore you have to just select something. And this is kind of a central problem and these traditional framework have been lacking. Now if you imagine this is a central problem and if you haven't been ignoring that problem, you can imagine the whole framework really have been done differently. So if you have to select from this huge book just one sentence to read then what can you do which sentence to select and so therefore this framework is selection centered framework does it work you know would it also wait another 50 years let's see and you know you can see that in fact it's starting to lots of things that didn't make sense start to make sense of course you say do we have to still wait 50 years before we go figure out whether you know let's hope not so one critical thing is not only is a new framework but also let's put into more scientific way of doing it and say can we actually find out it's wrong if it's wrong yeah can we find out in three years not 50 years and can we find out in three years that it's actually working you know it's hopeful let's continue and things like that yeah and so therefore it has to be and uh, not only this is a critical element that was not there before and also let's see how it works and uh, then decoding which is more or less recognition yeah first of all you have to select what bits of uh, signal to process and then and say uh, 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 how to recognize it. And there has to be in light of this critical selection centered framework. Okay. And so vision, it really is looking and seeing because selection is where you look and uh, mostly. And we are going to show that, in fact, selection really early uh, starts at primary visual cortex. And obviously, if you're going to CNN, that's not the case. You'd never have any bottleneck selecting only a very small fraction of the input. It's a really, really tiny, small fraction, less than 1% of the total input. Yeah. And so that will be fundamentally different. And then visual recognition involving v V1 and afterwards. If you put looking this way, it got to be very different. And if and that perhaps the previous uh, approach did not look at that way, that was probably the difficulty and so on and so forth. And can we then understand things like illusions and circuits and feed forward and feedback processes 
uh, especially feedback processes, which perhaps much less intuitive. Uh, yeah, and so how how is it done in the uh, in, in in this? Yeah, and as I say, it has to be testifiable and falsifiable. Let's say, and how well it works can it be <clears throat> improved if we find something's wrong. If it's not something something's not wrong, that's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So you're ready? Let's say uh, let's just have a quick give the background and so what do we know experimentally? Well, these are the facts. And with these facts, and then let's be scientists or the engineers and I say, can we then understand these facts? We're not just kind of uh, remember the facts as, a, as a, a list of things to remember. We have to understand, we'll be able to derive it and, and intuitively feel in your fingertips and so on, or mathematically, yeah? And so, okay. And so therefore there's three levels. One is what is the hardware in the neural level? You know, you have the imaging, sampling in the, in the beginning and then transformation and processing later, okay? And the behavior level, it's a little bit like you have a computer program, you're not allowed to, you know, look into the detail, but you kind of test it and test it. And so therefore you test it with a whole uh, black box and see what is the whole animal doing detection, recognition, what's their limit, and you know, what's what when it sometimes goes side effects and go wrong, illusions and recognition and so on. And the behavior, let's say, in, in, a, in a sense of when you actually uh, recognizing you're actually doing active vision, you have to look and see, yeah? And of course, uh, the, the, the ideal way is actually these two things are observed together in, in nature because you are recording from the neuron while the whole anim the animal is doing something, yeah? Okay, so the brain really, this is the monk, uh, this is the eye, and this is the brain uh, looking from the side. And if you uh, unfold this brain, this brain is like a collapsed balloon and you just spread it up and unfold. And this is really the unfold brain, like a sheet of a world map. And uh, the two retinas starting from here, the camera capturing data, just going to the primary visual cortex, you call it V1. It's like a visual area one, and then V2, V3, V4, and so on. This is really a monkey's brain, often used as a model of our human brain, yeah? And then, uh, you know, LIP and so on. But the whole idea is this bit of colored parts of the brain, like a world map and colored bits, is exclusively for vision, okay? The whole brain, just imagine you don't just see, you also have to hear, you have to remember, you have to add, control your limbs and so on. 50% of the monkey's brain is for vision. So that's no joke in a sense like uh, our eye is the window to our brain really is we are devoting so much of our uh, CPUs yeah, to vision. And just imagine our brain spends like uh, 20 to 25% of our whole blood uh, energy, metabolic energy. So that must be uh, expensive for, for some reason, yeah? And 50% for vision. And then the, the visual information is then going to the non-exclusive vision part, which is non-cover, uh, which is in the front of the brain, yeah? It's a frontal part, which usually we think we humans are smarter than other animal parts with a bigger frontal part or whatever, primates. So for instance, there's one thing called frontal eye field that kind of directs the the eye movement, and this is another, well, it has a little bit of memory guided eye movement component. And there's something called superior clicklus, which is kind of a, a mid brain because this sheet is a neocortex and this is a bit more ancient, but convolutionally conserved. That's more connected with uh, moving your eyes. So they imagine active vision, uh, deciding where your camera need to point to and so on. And of course it receives direct input from the retina. However, you know, retina really is a raw data. It also receives massive amount of input, to input from primary visual cortex and from this non exclusive in the frontal part, yeah, frontal eye field, and from this area called the parietal areas. Uh, and so, therefore, you can see that this area to direct your eye movement is having lots of commanding centers trying to tell uh, where to direct your eye movement, yeah. And, uh, uh, of course, this looks a bit messy, but you can also just uh, see the block diagram. And I highlighted this uh, gaze control bit. It's kind of, uh, uh, you can see that the retina, LGN, and uh, this is also called striate cortex because it's a biological uh, striate, yeah? And this whole uh, black box, uh, no, gray box is uh, 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 extra striate cortex. And a lot of these connections are actually reciprocal. It's not really uh, strictly uh, feed forward, yeah? And so this is reciprocal between V1 LGN and between V1 V2 and between V1 V4, okay? And the eye usually is, uh, everything is measured in terms of visual angle. So it's zero degrees in front and to the, to the side is a uh, uh, plus or minus, uh, you know, 
um, 90 degrees and uh, and if you zoom it up, this is how uh, the eye looks like and it's just a camera yeah and uh, uh, the image forms let's say you know in a little patch let's uh, this is actually optic nerve. Uh, yeah, where, where the cable just sent to the brain. But let's just look at a little pat, patch and zoom it up. You see the light comes in. Interestingly, the photoreceptors are really to the end. It has to go through all these uh, intermediate uh, image information. You know, this is the photoreceptors. We have uh, uh, millions of cones and even more rods and rods for, for the night vision. And then the next step in the horizontal cells, you can imagine this like a microprocessor and the bipolar cells, you know, they're mostly doing analog computing. It's not uh, digital, okay, because it's really using analog because it's not neural spikes until you really go to the last step. Then it digitized, the, this is an analog student ganglion cell, but then it digitized and it's sent to the uh, optic nerve by spikes. Yeah, so a lot of analog computing is in the retina. And, uh, and there's about 1 million of these uh, ganglion cells whose fiber cables are kind of bundled up and sent to the central brain. And so therefore this retina really is a very, uh, already a, a microprocessor in there, yeah? And of course th that was, uh, uh, then you can look at the color sampling, everybody know it's RGB and you just, you know, RGB has this kind of a light wavelength sensitivity. So you can imagine this you're familiar with, but another way of looking at it is really, not really in the raw RGB, but you're in, uh, more or less a piece CA decomposed uh, uh, three components, you know, from three to another three as a luminance, red, green, and uh, blue, yellow by some kind of a PCA transform. And uh, this is, in fact, uh, from that you can have one luminance, which is the first PCA, and two chromatic channels. And that's already uh, the terminology is used in, in psychology, in biology. You know, you have a luminance channel and two chromatic, but it's still 3D, but now it's kind of decorrelated because you can, you can see red and green. Uh, are very correlated because they are overlapping spectrum. So therefore, uh, to make it a bit more decorated, it's also intuitively makes sense. Of course, you can imagine when we start have the the movies and TVs in the beginning, we don't have to really the colored uh, television. You can more or less watch the movies black and white. That's good enough. Yeah. So therefore, you just keep the first principal component, component that will be good enough. Yeah. And uh, then, the, how about the spatial sampling? I just told you about the color sampling. The spatial sampling is is amazing. Just this is. Um, like the density of the photoreceptors on the retina versus the eccentricity. As I say, eccentricity, you know, zero is the fovea, which is the central vision, and plus minus 90 degrees is to the two sides. And you can see that the cone really is packed right at the zero. Okay, it's just so, so peak, really so peak, much more than we intuitively think. Yeah. And, um, it's it's uh, uh, you know this is really like a one over e is the eccentricity in terms of degrees yeah it really is uh, you know of course if your e zero is equal to zero that will be completely divergent but it's not exactly divergent e zero is only one or two degree now how much is one degree if you put your thumb in front of you the thumb width is about one degree so it really is like a tunnel vision that's where we can see something uh, uh, like uh, the rest is more or less blind, yeah. Okay, and the rods and the, and the night vision is is uh, is actually nothing in the center of you know this night vision. Your center vision, you you are actually almost blind because, and so therefore, if you want to see at night, you have to kind of tilt your gaze a little bit, yeah. And uh, uh, you know your your rod is uh, peaked almost uh, near fifteen degrees, and so therefore. You know, if you want to look in the dim sky, don't look at straight because uh, there's no photoreceptor there. Yeah, you have to tilt your gaze a little bit. And this gives you an illustration of what is your visual acuity in the sense that if you fixate near the center, yeah, and then uh, uh, everything is looks uh, looks as legible. Yeah, if you just keep your gaze there, then all letters look equally legible. That's how bad in the periphery that it needs to be that big in the center can be so tiny. And that's reflecting a lot uh, in the sampling, but also a lot about the brain you will see. It's actually the central processor is also reflecting, uh, not just the sampling of your camera, yeah? And so how does the central processor imagine this is a half your visual field, yeah? And so therefore this is the fovea really the center. Remember it's a tunnel vision, really one degree center is the uh, highest. And this bit is monocular because your eyes, you know, only two eyes only go that way, yeah? The beyond that it's only one eye can see and beyond that one eye can see. And this is its map into a retinotopic V1. And you can imagine you spread out the V1 and the center really tiny one degree going to map into such a huge 
area, which is more or less matching the number of photoreceptors you actually have at the fovea. It really is devoting a lot, but while this uh, peripheral region only going to such a small area, yeah? Am I recording? Should I record? Am I recording? Let me see. Um, how do I know whether I'm recording or not? Anybody knows? Am I recording? Any? Uh, oh, it is recording. It says stop recording. So that's good because the audience may want to see the record. Okay, that's good. And uh, uh, okay. Okay, so eccentricity, you know, got zero to, uh, you know, 90 degrees to a side is going from this way, and this going, you know, the, this uh, asthmus going that way, and another asthmus a bit further away going that way, and so you can see, you know, the radius and asthmus in the, in the real world is translated into x and y in the cortex, and so this is more or less a, a like a, approximately a, a complex logarithmic transform, yeah? And so that's very interesting. There's a little bit, uh, uh, if you like to get, dig into details, there's more you can look into that. And so often you can uh, quantify it by a, a cortical magnification factor. That means how much you magnify a tiny little thing into a big piece of CPU for it. And so you can imagine it's a huge magnification near the fovea, and so therefore, the magnitude factor is also one over E plus E, as this E is again eccentricity in degrees, yeah? And so therefore magnifying really a lot uh, near the fovea. So let me show you what that means in terms of a lot of uh, more than just sampling, it's also processing, okay? So in the end, in the hardware has to go to behavior. So if you fix it in the, in the cross, you can see these letter two T's equally well, yeah? Very good. That means your resolution in your fovea is already quite good even though you fix it here okay so therefore uh, not resolution your peripheral so your retinal resolution here is good enough even if you fix it here okay very good now imagine uh, i put more letters over there i know that you could see that if you fix it here but suddenly if you keep fixing it you cannot see the letter t anymore right okay so that means even though your retina sampling you know go back if you fix it you can see the t yeah so your retina resolution is good enough However, your central brain start to screw you up, yeah? And so CPU is adding something very strange, okay? We need to understand that's so part of the algorithm. That's probably not in a computer vision. And so therefore this, this is called visual crowding in the sense that something's crowding it, which is not on your retina, but it's in your brain and it's uh, interesting, yeah? Okay. And then, uh, of course, uh, how do you uh, do physiologically? You just more or less put the animal in front of a screen, then you just shine things on the screen while you're recording from a neuron, see what kind of things you shine on a screen that make a neuron fire be activated. And uh, whatever the bits on the screen that make a neuron activated is defined as the rest of the field, the limited region of the visual space to excite a particular neuron. And so they can imagine that one neuron is the field here, another neuron is the field there, so it could be different from different neurons, of course. If you want to sample the whole screen, then you need to really have different neuron devoted to cover the whole visual field, yeah? And uh, so therefore, again, uh, uh, one degree is, uh, uh, is like a thumb in front of you uh, when you stretch uh, your arms out. And then you see rest of field size really increase from bottom to up. So for instance, this is 0 0.06 degree, really, really tiny. You can see something really small, yeah? After all, you know, I can see the fingerprints in my, in my yeah, finger when it's stretched out, yeah, really tiny. However, at the top, IT is really, really big. Maybe it's the same as your CNN or not. You can think about that. This, you know, 20, 50 degree is that big, really quite big, yeah? Each neuron, each neuron is covering a very huge rest of the field. And um, unfortunately, as I said, that uh, after all these decades, uh, most is only known about the retina and V1 into the rest of the field and very little outside. Well, not very little. Comparatively, we are almost ignorant uh, uh, beyond V1 uh, relative to how knowledgeable we are are about retina V1, okay? So for instance, as I said, that the uh, retina is just lots of sampling of dots, and then they find out that uh, in V1 is lots of uh, these uh, edge detectors and bio detectors and so on. And then uh, beyond, they find, okay, V2, V4, posterior, and all these areas, you know, these very complex stuff, you can say, oh, is that exponential explosion of things make it difficult? But obviously, you know, V2 is not that explosion as we'll see later. 
Okay, and uh, and also uh, the recessive field. Exactly, what is this filtering property? Whether it's linear, nonlinear, all these kind of things, are really affected by whether the animal is anesthetized or not anesthetized. Where you're measuring it, or whether the animal is paying attention or not. However, in the front end, like a retina V1, it matters less. So obviously, there's something passive, there's something active going on. There's a qualitative difference beyond V1. Yeah. Okay. And uh, typically, when you do psychology experiments, you put an observer in front of a visual display, and then you know you're they're giving a task. They say, "Oh, is there a face on the display?" You know, they're giving a task to do, and they're supposed to report their task by, you know, whether by saying and pressing button. This is how you record their data, and they may you may also record their eye movement, record their heartbeat, record their brain uh, uh, pupil size. You know, the, the EEG wave, and uh, you may uh, even do the MEG, fMI, and so therefore it's like a non-invasive way of doing but of course if you have a chance you can have access to brain patients for surgery you can even have invasive way of doing and uh, you can even add other signals like a sound on top of it and so on and so that these are the example topics if you go to vision conference from these behavior stuff i know there are just so many yeah don't worry if you don't really understand them they're just for giving a gist and they ah, what kind of things people say you know you go to different sessions you know these are parallel sessions going on i say oh, okay that's what it's going on yeah and so uh uh, there's lots of uh, excellent textbooks uh, that's more in the psychological field and uh, uh, maybe, uh, yeah. And so for instance, let me just give you some highlights to, to, to ponder for you to think about what could be going on. So for example, you can have random dot sequence where you know, just a random dot, uh, nothing is going on. Maybe there's another random dot patch in the square in front of it. And you copy that into your right eye. So these are two eyes, exactly the same, yeah? And now uh, the, this square is like that. If I don't outline it, you would not tell the difference. But, but let's say just shift the, the square a, a, in one eye to one way and suddenly, you can see the square in front of you, yeah? And so how does the brain do that? The brain, it, it basically, monocularly, you have no clue, but somehow they combine it to do some computation. And here is a, probably you have seen it called Adelson's checkerboard illusion A and B. They look kind of a one dark, one, one bright, but actually, you know, they have the same luminance on the screen, on the display, and they look the same. Yeah, they, but they don't look the same because of the shadow uh, and so on, yeah? It's interesting. The brain does these kind of transformations of perception and a, a camera, two different things. And here again, you all see this triangle so white that you may even think that this patch is whiter than the than outside patch, but actually they're the same. So your brain has this kind of imagination from very limited data, you know, just a little bit of an edge here and this and that, and then just make you see all that, yeah? You know, the more or less all these are kind of a hints to make you see, you, you, you see a whole black disc. It's not a disc uh, lacking something, yeah? Uh, and uh, in the brain, of course, uh, you know, retina, you have these sampling that is actually quite uh, limited by your diffraction limit, and that's a visual acuity you can actually measure. It's about, uh, 0.02, but you can also ask people whether these two vertical lines, you know, which one is to the left or right, and they can have a very small back gap, much smaller than that, and this gap they can do is 0.002, okay? Of course, this is after some CPU processing, and that's called hyperacuity. That means it's more than this uh, Nyquist limit of your sampling uh, in, on the retina. And here is an interesting illusion. Do you see that two rings kind of rotating uh, clockwise, yeah? But actually, well, you just look at that patch. That patch is never moving away from, you know, just back and forth, uh, left and right. Yeah, do you see that? Uh, and uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you don't just stare into that patch, you just have the whole. Uh, this is called reverse fire illusion. Okay, I give you another illusion for fun. Do you see a lot of flashing dots? Yeah, but wherever you stare, at, it's not flashing. Yeah. So in your central visual field, it's not flashing. In your peripheral, just about a few degrees away, it's flashing, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. We will see later why. We will have an explanation for that, a possible explanation. And uh, do you see anything here? Strange. Look gibberish, yeah? But you put a cruder in front of it, suddenly you see lots of letter Bs, isn't it? Isn't that just really amazing? Uh, and do you see anything there? What is it in there? A duck. Where are you? You have a very good, lots of people did not know it's a duck. But once you know it, it's a vividly duck, isn't it? So it's like a, your brain has this imagination power. If you get a little bit of a hint, maybe just a fee for a hint. 
And what do you see? You may see a vase or you may see two faces. So you can have an ambiguous perception. And then the, the brain has to kind of decide between them and also between them you can, you know, present something in your left eye different from your right eye. Then what do you see? You kind of alternate between them. These are some kind of a, uh, you can say psychological method trying to debug or trying to, uh, as a detective, trying to dissect what's the brain doing, yeah? And uh, here is something also uh, recently seeing uh, amazing. So you see that, okay, there is a unique letter O among letter uh, X, no problem, yeah? And uh, if you put most of the things in your left eye, okay, but one letter to your right eye, what would you see? you will see a superposition of it, okay? There's no difference because your brain beyond V1 cannot tell whether it's from the left eye or right eye, yeah? And this X is uniquely to the right eye, but your brain could not tell, okay? But strangely, your eye movement can tell. Your eye movement will automatically go there as if it's a robot, why? And so therefore, implicating V1 is doing eye movement, okay? So the first eye movement is captured by that, amazing, yeah? So like that. And, uh, um, and so, so now let's dive in a bit more details, like what are the rest of the few people, people uh, measure, okay? The, a neurobiologist, so let's say the signal, input signal is write as X, it's a function of space, time, and what cone is coming from RGB and what eye is coming from left or right eye. So it's kind of four dimensional kind of thing. And the output, if it's a neuron is linear, it's a, it's a filter, K, I call K because, you know, kernel, you probably see kernels. Yeah, so linear kernel K acting on this for a one particular neuron, okay, with some spontaneous activities. And uh, so therefore what you want to measure in the experiment is really what that K is. And uh, often in lots of experiments, they just focus on one dimension. Let's say focus on space, then what is the spatial filter? Okay, in that case, you pretend it's not a function of time at all. Otherwise, a neuron's activity is a function of time and it's spatial. Or you can say, what if I want to see space and time? Sometimes they want to see motion and movies, and then you can write it as a spatial temporal kernel. Or you say, what about space and color? Yeah, you, uh, so this is often when you focus on one question at a time, but how about disparity for, for stereo vision and so on and so forth. And that's what people measure. And of course, then you have, for instance, the spatial rest of the field, O is equal to kernel X at LSS. And they found that in, in the retina, really this rest of spatial rest of the field is a difference of two Gaussians. And that's called center, surround center Gaussian is small, excitatory surround Gaussian is bigger. And the difference between the center Gaussian uh, difference uh, is your center surround rest of the field. And so therefore they call the center region is the on region of the rest of the field and surround region negative part is the off region. These are just terminologies. Uh, and then when you see that, oh, now I see, you know, you don't get afraid when you read biological papers. And so this is called on center of surround rest of the field. And this neuron will be called on center neuron. And if it's the other way around, you know, let's say these uh, weights. Okay, so this is the Gaussian with weight WC for the center, weight WS for the surround. So two Gaussians weighted by these two positive values, it will be uncentered neuron. If they are both negative, it will be off center neuron. And so in the retina, you indeed have these two kinds. And uh, another thing people do is you'll be very comfortable with it, just do Fourier transform, okay? And on the other hand, what does the Fourier transform do is because in psychology, people would like to measure, it's called contrast sensitivity, but more or less it's a spatial function to a Fourier transform. So therefore, uh, uh, so, so the, you all know it can be cosine, sine transform or exponential transform you like. It's more or less you're trying to put the center of the field to, to measure its activity, its response to a sine wave, which of the high frequency, low frequency, and so on, see how it responds. And this, this gain really is the response um, uh, sensitivity. And that's what people measure for spatial frequency of this grating, they call it grating, yeah, sine wave. And this is the response magnitude. And you see that it's a band fast filter. It's kind of peaking around, let's say this frequency, yeah. This frequency is too high, this frequency too low, too high, too low, the gain is small, but if it's uh, the frequency right around the size of the receptor field, that's perfect. Now, can you visualize your own sensitivity? Yeah, you can see your whole, you know, you can, that what, what I showed is for one particular neuron, but now you see your, for your whole brain, okay? You can see it. 
So this is a spatial frequency increasing, you know, so low spatial frequency, high spatial frequency. And this is contrast, okay? It's very high contrast, white, black, white, black, blah, 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 and lower contrast, so white, black. And, and can you see that? Yeah, you can see, 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 but somehow here you find I cannot see, yeah? So where is the edge? You cannot see the contrast, more or less, is your sensitivity. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is more or less your sensitivity curve. Is that your visibility boundary? Yeah? Good. Uh, just a quick feedback. Is it too fast, too slow? But I really am racing. And I kind of look at you, have your facial feedback. and say, Okay, you're nodding. That's good. I keep on going. Yeah? And so if I can go faster, you can see a bit more. Okay? You just give me like a, yeah? Okay? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So do you see this visibility boundary? That's more or less, you can, the whole animal sees that, but here is, uh, okay. Whole, one cell sees that. Okay. This is the cell's response and, and that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So this is what people also measure in psychology. So you can, uh, in whole behavior. Okay. Retina color processing, as I say, you can uh, have these uh, three, uh, uh, three uh, axes. Then you find the retinal ganglion cell, the one that sends signal to the CPU, to the brain, has these kind of receptive field. They have a red excitatory center, so it's sensitive to red signal in the center, but inhibited to by, by green signal. This is in contrast to earlier, remember that receptive field is sensitive to a bright spot in the center and, and uh, uh, inhibited by bright spot in the surround, but is more excited by dark spot in the surround, yeah? And now if you include color, it becomes uh, this way, excited by red in the center, inhibited by green in the surround, or excited by blue in the center, inhibited by yellow in the surround. It's like these axes are spread out that way. And so you can see this is a neuron trying to multiplex uh, spatial luminance signals with spatial chromatic signal in one single neuron, yeah? And of course, it's not single neuron, we have many neurons. And this is the human sensitivity. So imagine, remember, we were trying to visualize this contrast sensitivity, but when there's no color, so this is only luminance, yeah? And so you are sensitive to kind of a, this band, but not sensitive to the low frequency and high frequency band. But if you're looking to the color, what you see is the color the color channel, you are actually more lower pass, okay? You're also sensitive to lower frequency, but really have a, a quick high frequency cutoff. While luminance band, you already visualize, it's a band pass kind of like that, okay? And so you can uh, use your uh, uh, psychology experiment, they, they measure these kind of things. Uh, for higher, you know, for, for, for a higher spatial frequency, uh, sensitivity to, to color is weaker. But for lower spatial frequency sensitive to color is stronger, yeah. And so, uh, um, and then you can also look at the spatial temporal filters. That's good for motion. And you can imagine this is actually a Weasel who, who later did V1 a lot. Uh, you, you can see that this is uh, uh, so. This is like a um, you can turn on a light. You can turn on screen. Uh, this, this display is like a hole in the center, a dark spot in the center. Uh, uh, bright, uh, bright ring, and you turn it on at this time and turn it off at this time. So this is about uh, half a second or a little bit more than half a second. And then this new, this is spike is a neuron's response. You measure from electrophysiology. You find that suddenly spike really, really go up, okay? And then a kind of a steady state, uh, start to reach a steady state. And then when you turn it off, it suddenly drop down. Here is when you have an input, just a small spot. Uh, immediately when it's turned on, fire a lot, and then start to dip. And so therefore this is a center surround with the field as response. But the temporal, you see, this is a temporal, this is the temporal kernel, okay? So this is the temporal kernel. It has roughly about you know, 0 0.1 seconds, so about 10 Hertz, five Hertz is range is the most sensitive for this uh, uh, neuron. Yeah, and so therefore remember we have the center surround receptive field, you know, excited by center, inhibited by surround. So center surround receptive field, remember we have these weights, WC and WS, but now this weight is really not a temporal, uh, filter, yeah, temporal impulse response function as the engineering terms, and uh, each one, uh, 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 they're different from each other, more or less, you can say characteristic by how wide that could be, yeah, and uh, so for instance, if you give a spatial, 
uh, temporal uh, grating, the drifting grating. For instance, this is a drifting grating and see how the neuron respond. And then uh, the neuron, of course, will in the end also respond as a sine, uh, temp uh, sinusoidal temporal functions. And then you can get its uh, spatial temporal Fourier transform, thank you, uh, to, to get this uh, uh, a gain for this particular spatial temporal wave, yeah? And uh, for a particular spatial temporal frequency K and omega, and uh, and therefore therefore you get this uh, transform, okay? And, and uh, this is the characteristic curve for one neuron, for instance, in LGN, which is the next stage after uh, retina before it reaches V1. And this is spatial frequency, horizontal, and the contrast sensitivity uh, as this uh, Fourier transform of 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 this kernel, okay? You see for different three different temporal frequencies. The so low temporal frequency it goes like this. Okay, there really is a band pass filter in space, but high temporal frequency, it becomes a low pass filter. Yeah. So it's not a spatial temporal separable filter. It's really kind of a, you know, these three curves, curves are not scaled versions of each other. If I go going from low pass to band pass, yeah, band pass to low pass as the uh, temporal frequency goes higher. Okay, three different temporal frequencies here. And this is uh, for a human observer when you just have a spatial frequency equal to zero. So it's a bright field, dark and uh, just flashing on and off with different temporal frequency. You can see that different temporal frequency, uh, it depends on whether your uh, uh, environment is dim, then it's really low, low pass. When your environment is bright, it's become a band pass in temporal frequency. So horizontal is temporal frequency, yeah? And so you can measure in neurons, you can measure in the whole animal, and you can you say, how can I link one neuron to a whole animal? That's theoretical understanding, yeah? Or, or, or so on, so, okay. Left and right eyes, they are they're sent to the brain. Of course, each eye sees the whole visual field. You can cover one eye, you'll see both left and right visual field, yeah? And uh, and turns out that uh, half the visual field go to half the brain. So this bit of a visual field is projected to that. And so your right brain, brain receives the left half of the visual field from both eyes, and your left brain the other way around. And so this is how it goes. Then you go to the, okay, uh, unfortunately, we really do not understand what's going on in the intermediate stage. So therefore, people still treat it like a relay station, but you don't think the brain will just do really for nothing. So therefore, it's still ignorant. Let's pretend it's still relay station and go to the next uh, V1 stage. Oh, um, and then at the V1 stage, you have uh, uh, these Gabor-like filters. The receptor no longer isotropically center surround, and it becomes this Gabor-like field, which is a sinusoidal wave with a particular frequency K, a particular phase, but windowed by a Gaussian, spatial, uh, spatial Gaussian, okay? And these Gabor filter, if you do Fourier transform, then you will, of course, Gaussian in space is Gaussian in frequency. So therefore it will be tuned to a small bandwidth of a Gaussian frequency in a, the limited bandwidth, uh, with the, the bandwidth should be kind of a uh, inversely related to how wide is the spatial uh, Gaussian window. This is the uncertainty principle I assume you're familiar with. And so therefore, um, but turns out that this, how big is the bandwidth if we define, you know, in some half wave height or whatever, and often in engineering terms, you like to measure in octaves. And this turns out that the high spatial frequency and low end, they're about a factor of three. Isn't that weird? Uh, in, in digital um, engineering, usually we like to do a factor of two, you know, kind of a one octave. But in the brain, they like to do a factor of three. Like to do, why is that? That may be interesting, yeah? But anyway, it's, it's, so therefore it's 1.5 octave rather than one octave. And then say, okay, remember we had this spatial temporal, uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, contrast sensitivity of the retina cell. It's much bigger than 1.5 octave. So 1.5 octave is only a small band in it. What can you do? Well, different neurons will just have to cover different part of that whole band, yeah? And so therefore you can see, you know, some neurons have a bigger rest of the field, some have smaller rest of the field. In V1, some neurons turn to vertical orientation, some neurons turn to tilted orientation. So this really is a multi-band, multi-orientation representation in V1. And remember, even in this, uh, uh, in this whole body, it is much more than 1.5 octave, yeah? So this is how many? 
uh, 0.03 to 30. So this is many, many more than 1.4 active. Yeah, and so it's, it's a, just to remind you that's the case. But anyway, for the high spatial frequency and it's for a small residual field and a large residual field need to be lower spatial frequency. And then um, you, you can see this is actually the recording uh, in monkey V1 at uh, 10 degrees from the center of gaze. This is uh, like a 17, yeah? Yeah, 17 neurons receive the field each by this kind of rectangular uh, region shows that this is part of a uh, visual field will excite that neuron. Okay, you can see some receptive fields are much bigger than others, so it's indeed a multi scale representation in the uh, in the brain at a single location. Yeah, and this is uh, uh, yeah, this is. Uh, this is about one degree, I think. But anyway, you can carve it up into a spatial frequency region, horizontal frequency, vertical frequency. So each of this kind of ellipse is really the frequency tuning bandwidth for one single neuron. So some smallest field neurons having big band, this is a linear scale, okay? Big bands in the high frequency, and in the center, center region, it's a low frequency center region. Of course, then you have a big residual field. And because the center is isotropic, it's no directional. So you can also have non-orientation selective neurons, but they are small minority, but they're there in V1. I don't know whether CNN has these kind of non-orientation selective neurons, yeah? Filters, do you have that? Uh, but it's there, okay, in the brain. And uh, at the different, uh, you know, directions, it's different orientations and so on. And uh, yeah, so some neurons are horizontally tuned, some are vertically tuned, and some are larger as the field when it's smaller frequency, and the largest as the field in this really zero frequency, it's not even orientationally tuned, yeah? And uh, um, yeah, the, the largest one is for the small frequency. This is just one dimensional frequency in terms of uh, magnitude only. This is the magnitude of the frequency. This is the whole 2D space of frequency, horizontal and vertical frequency, yeah? Is it okay? Okay, and now let's also include color. Again, we are gonna plot just magnitude of frequency, spatial frequency, and this contrast sensitivity. You see that the color filter really is for slow pass color filter, okay? So therefore it's also multiple bands, okay? And so the smallest band you can imagine it's mostly color because color sensitivity is very high. So you have very large fields in V1 tuned to uh, uh, color. Okay, in this case, a uh, color contrast between red and green. So this neuron is uh, excited by red in the center and inhibited by green in the center, but it's excited by green in the surround and inhibited by red in the surround. So it's a huge risk of fear, okay? Now this one, okay, this is a, a double opponent, we call it double opponent. And, and remember in the retina, it's like that. The smallest of you, it's red excited in the center, but there's no green in the center. And uh, inhibitory green in the surround, but he is excitedly green in the surround. So you can see there's a transformation from the retina to V1, yeah? And then at the higher intermediate band, you can have neurons tuned both to color and orientation. So you have conjunctive tuning tunings of in a single neuron to both color and orientation. And in a high frequency band, you more or less lose the color. You just have uh, uh, these uh, um, only luminance, okay? So that's why uh, if you want to multiplex color information in your television, they, they don't really occupy that much of a bandwidth because they really are very low resolution. So therefore you can uh, just add a little bit more color, the data band is not that much because the highest frequency, the spatial detail is all non-colored for your human vision, yeah? Okay, and you can also go into space time. So this is for instance, it's a space time filter. Space is this filter, like a Gabor filter time is this impulse response. So this is a space time separable filter. And so this is a V1 neuron that is not tuned to any uh, space time um, motion direction because space time is separable. Uh, you can have another one that's also space time separable, but maybe uh, even spatial filter become an all spatial filter and uh, the time filter can also be slightly different. Uh, from, from that time filter, but you can combine them and get a space-time non-separable filter. And this filter will be tuned to a particular space-time orientation, which is actually motion direction. 
Yeah, space time oriented filter is a motion directions filter. And so it turns out that in V1, you have these kind of filters and that kind of filter and then kind of filter. And mathematically, we know this has these kind of transform, but in individual V1 neurons, you have the whole class. Okay, I'm just trying to show that X1, V1, X2, V2, that's why this is moves from X1 to X2 or vice versa, there's kind of a motion. Okay, actually it's for this motion. For this filter, it's for that motion. So this neuron is tuned to rightward motion. Okay, because time, this is the impulse response function. Okay, and uh, so V1 have a diverse of neurons. Some neurons are tuned to uh, tuned to diverse motion direction to the leftward motion, right motion, top motion, top, you know, and that and their sensitivity, some are purely to motion direction so they say they're exclusive uh, motion one direction others both direction that uh, opposite direction they will be equally responsive and uh, and a whole uh, continuous of spectrum yeah and so this one is the purely right uh, uh, yeah uh, to to uh, right right one motion and this is purely to uh, indiscriminative to motion directions and the whole spectrum in between yeah and you can also look at two eyes and so uh, the input from the left eye, SL, signal from the left eye, signal from the right eye, and a neuron then can be described by a resistive field for the left eye input and the resistive field for the right eye input. This is a linear neuron. If linear neuron, you do it that way, yeah? And experimentally, you just have to measure what are these resistive fields, and turns out these resistive fields may, uh, may again be described, let's say, by two Gabor filters, one for the left eye, one for the right eye, and uh they can be centered at, at uh, uh, uh you know most active at the different um, uh, locations xl and xr and this will be the difference between them will be the preferred disparity of this neuron so this neuron will have a particular preferred disparity something this distance to your 3d world will activate this neuron so yeah and they can have different gains and this different gains in, in biology is called ocular dominance so one can have a smaller gain one can have a bigger gain so monocular neurons when the, these two gains differ a lot from each other binocular neurons they are almost equal so in in the v1 you can even optically imaging these kind of gains by some kind of visualization technique uh, uh, for the darker spot stripes for one eye and the lighter stripe for the other eye. So you can see in V1, different ne neurons for preferring different eyes are clustered into these stripes. It's called ocular dominance columns. However, you find that these columns disappear in V2 because by V2, the gains to the two eyes are almost equal. So that's why I remember I said that your brain cannot tell whether something is from your left eye or something to your right unless you kind of cheat by close one eye and see which eye sees that if you open both eye if you're both eye equally good camera quality then you should be not be able to tell okay and so somehow the brain throw away that information which camera sees what by v2 yeah and so of course in computer vision you can have 10 cameras and you can see which camera sees what yeah and so, and of course, so far we've been talking about just the simple linear cells, but in V1 you actually have complex cell, usually it can be modeled by the energy model, which is actually a combination of two simple cells, let's call it kernel K1 and K2. Usually they're at the same location, except one is a sign at a 90 degree apart in phase, yeah? And uh, so if you give an input grating, you can have a particular grating more or less matching its, its preferred spatial frequency. And uh, so therefore the linear filters will have linear response one for K1 and linear response two for K2. So what complex cells do, of course, each complex, uh, each filter is to a spatial frequency band center for this frequency. And yeah, this frequency is for the sine wave frequency K. But anyway, for these two linear response L1 and L2, what complex cell does is just take that square and that's that output okay so they called energy model of a complex cell but you can ask what is a complex cell trying to do of course this is also in cnn you can say do the max and all these kind of things what is it trying to do actually it's throwing away information isn't it yeah you can say it's building invariance invariance also means throwing away information they're already starting v1 and uh, uh, somehow it's like to have these quadrature filters such that it's just right yeah uh, and uh uh, invariant to the phase, the phase within this Gaussian window. So therefore, any bars, whether it's bar or edge, will activate this neuron as long as within this vague Gaussian window. So it's throwing away some spatial details, yeah? 
And this is called a quadrature pair because their face is 90 degrees apart from each other. And uh, yeah, anyway, some details of how uh, then you do a, an additional nonlinear transform after this energy. But more or less, this is we're describing that complex cells. You know, you can say this transform is a sigmoid function of this energy E. That's what V1's complex cell is. This is in space. You can also do it for motion energy. So this particular motion direction, space time. And, but you can have different phases put into L1, L2, and then it's any motion in that way, whether it's black dot motion or right dot motion, whatever, it doesn't matter. And this is the motion energy model. And similarly for disparity, you can say any disparity for a particular depth, it doesn't matter the details. Again, simple cell number one for one particular disparity and simple cell number two, Okay, this is for simple cell number one. Simple cell means the linear cell, okay? Linear cell number two, same disparity, but in a different kind of a spatial phase a little bit, such that, you know, there's a spatial phase about nine degrees apart. And then that's how you get your complex cell uh, from the L1, L2 to, to uh, uh, you get your complex cell. So you can see a lot of sim uh, same thing into a diversity of neurons if you don't think, uh, uh, in these ways or related to each other, you will feel a bit overwhelmed. There's so many different things, but actually they're all kind of a underlying the same idea, just manifested in different dimensions, yeah? Uh, and then, of course, this is still just a fact where we're trying to understand the computational reason later. Now, the kind of a good news and bad news start to happen. You say, well, all these things happen like that, just I can imagine CNN. What else? Ha, huh, looks like there's something called extra class crystal field. So this filter, let's say, has a is, is only kernel space more or less in this location at this uh, region. This is uh, called a class crystal field. The idea is if you put a vertical bar in it, let's say this filter is preferring vertical bar, it will respond. And let's just normalize its response to one. Okay. Our curve, by definition, if you put things outside, it will not respond. So far, so good. This is how classically you understand what a filter is. Then you start to happen. You put something inside and outside, response 0 0.3. What's going to happen? What's happening? This is where things start to be non-intuitive, yeah? Now, if it's put together, it should be equal to one, no? How, uh, so this is the optimal stimulus within the class of the build the response so little. Now, if you put the outside bars not uniformly oriented like the inside bar, just randomly oriented, response 0 0.5. That's why it's called extra classical. Something else is going on. But if you make a orthogonally oriented 0 0.8, okay? But if you make it a collinear, you know, it's kind of contextually lined up into a curve, then it will be more than one. If this is normalized, sorry, it will, it will also excite. It's not just inhibit. Okay, so this is facilitation and the response will multiply. Uh, this usually works only when inside the, uh, uh, the bar is too weak. Okay, not too weak, it is weak, such that the neuron is not responding that much, but you add out also. So V1 is actually a recurrent network. It's not just a feed forward network. So all these extra classical is the field is reflecting recurrence. So what's going on? Here is a patch of V1, 500, um, small patch of V1. V1 is uh, as big as like a credit card. So this is only like a two millimeters. Uh, uh, so it's a small patch of V1, okay? It's two millimeter by two millimeter. And all these different uh, color is trying to visualize what's the underlying cluster of neurons. So if it's colored blue, it means underlying cluster of neurons prefer vertical orientation, they cluster together, okay? If it's colored reddish, then it's prefer horizontal orientation, so. And superposed on top of it, this is a 500 micron, that's why this is about two or three millimeters wide. It's a small patch of V1. And here is the cell origin of a cell. Uh, uh, yeah, anyway, anyway, you can, you, can, you can try to dye a cell, trying to visualize it. Uh, the, the cell body is around here. And these black uh, things are actually the neurons axons, terminals projecting from the cell body from here. They project far away into the territory of other neurons, okay? But you see that the cell patch is in the blue patch. So it's in, for neurons preferring vertical orientation. It's also projecting more or less to blue patch, no? It avoids the red patches, no? 
So this recurrent network is not randomly connected to other neurons. It's selectively connected to other neurons that's also in group patch. So neurons tuned to the same orientation are connected in this recurrent network, okay? And so therefore there are these kind of connections going on. And uh, this could be the reason why this is going on. You all these vertical neurons are suppressing each other, this recurrent suppression, okay? And that, that might explain that, the mutual suppression between two neurons responding to the two bars, they are vertical and they mutually suppress. But people say, well, wait a minute, you also have feedback, yeah? Remember V1 is sending to V2, V2 might be having feedback, you know, so there's, this is too controversial. I'm going to show you more details later. People say it could be feedback, okay? So feedback from higher visual areas, possible causes from this. They're still debating, okay? We'll see more details later. So anyway, this is bad news. Now the recurrency starts to happen, and this is uh, uh, maybe good news. That's the intelligence of the brain. Okay, we'll find out. And as I said, receive a few higher areas uh, start to get bigger and bigger. But one thing start to happen is in V1, you can see the whole field left and right beyond 80 degrees. Okay, you really see the whole field. However, by the time it's V2, you only see more or less the binocular region, plus minus 40 degrees. Okay, so things are getting narrower and narrower. And compared to situation to V1, it's much more difficult to find these with the field properties. Say, ha, I'm going to flash this on the screen to see what excites a neuron. But well, looks like it's not that easy. OK, oh, I already have passed the time, yeah? But anyway, my god, it's almost there. OK, V2, uh, they're almost like V1, but they start to respond to, to kind of a uh, 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 you know, illusory contours. I'm sorry, I'm starting to pass the time. Illusory contours and the, and the V4, uh, I, MT is for, for, for kind of a motion. And uh, maybe I should just quickly sell it. it and the neurons response depends on your illusion, uh, depending on your perception. So for instance, if you have something rotating cylinder, project on a screen, you say, hey, is it rotating black, you know, counterclockwise or clockwise? Hmm, I don't know. Then the MT response depends on what you see. So you see one way, MT responds, so you see another way, I think another way. Okay, V4, you know, if you're lesion V4, I'm gonna really, sorry, I wasn't really watching this uh, time, yeah? So you should go to the, uh, an IT, really big rest of the field, you know, what is it trying to do, you know, all these strange things. Uh, but anyway, these rest of the fields are much less known than rest of the field in V1. We're going to get into more details. But interesting thing is if you uh, delete V1, it's somehow lesion and somehow the, uh, sub, uh, the, the, the patient will deny seeing something but can walk around obstacles without realizing that he can walk around obstacles. So it's called blind sight, okay? And also you can have some bit of a visual pathway is seeing what and other seeing where. So for instance, uh, uh, an observer, you say, hey, could you hold a, a letter to, to match this post? It cannot match, it, it doesn't see it. But could you insert it and you can insert, okay? So somehow cannot see, but it knows what to do. So these are very strange. This is, you know, it knows how to do, but it doesn't know how to match it. How to match it, doesn't know. Okay, that's the idea. Uh, and uh, hemi neglect people, you know, if you have lesions in this uh, parietal areas, you find that uh, you wanna uh, circle all the letters. They only circle the right side, but ignore all these other letters. And you can draw a clock. It can only draw the right side of the clock, but somehow ignore the, the, the other, other half and so on. And uh, you can also look at the latencies, okay? If you have a visual stimulus onset time t equal to zero, 40 milliseconds later, V1 start to respond and V4 responds 70 milliseconds later and 100 milliseconds later, uh, 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 that responds, okay? However, if things are very complicated, uh, you somehow need a hard object discrimination. IT neurons, you need about 150 milliseconds for these objects that uh, people find it hard. It's actually CNA will find it hard to discriminate. Yeah. And it's just suggesting this recurrent processing. I'm going to dig into more detail. Eye movement. Yeah. Can you see difference between two of these images? Difficult. Yeah. It shows you're attentionally blind, where you're more or less blind. No. Difficult, yeah? Well, actually, difference is there. That's, yeah, it's very difficult. And uh, uh, people find that you, uh, yeah, you cannot move your eyes to one location and pay attention to another location at the same time. Almost impossible. But if you don't move your eye, you can stare one way and the corner of your eye pay attention to somewhere else, okay? And uh, 
uh, you find, as I say, eye movement, you know, uh, the center is superior critical. You receive in profound different multiple regions. So therefore you can see some bit of your eye movement is bottom up and top down. Just give you an idea. Your eye moves three times a second. So therefore for a whole hour, uh, a whole, whole, whole minute, okay. Whole minute you move 180 times. Do you feel you move your 180 times in a minute? You don't, right? You probably feel like. 10 times. So most of your eye movement are completely involuntary. There's something below the tip of the iceberg the brain is processing, okay? That really is something very interesting. And, and, and so on. I think let's just uh, finish uh, there because I should finish. But anyway, I just kind of try to cram you with all these uh, massive around of things that you have to study for a whole semester or something like that and trying to put in your short-term memory, and then we come back at what time? Next time, start on, on time, okay? Uh, 20 minutes later, 10 o'clock, okay? We try to start the first stage of understanding so that you don't have to memorize them, you can understand them to some extent, or be puzzled by, gee, what's this going on? Keep it, the puzzle in your brain. Thank you very much, okay? See you in at 10 o'clock.